Hello, welcome to Curious Minds. Evan Vansicle back at you from Albuquerque, New Mexico. It is summer. We passed Memorial Day weekend, so it's officially camping season, right? Time to get out and have some adventure. Thankfully, people are doing that, which I think is restoring us back to some level of sanity, right? Also, they're opening up some businesses. I think here in a couple days, you can actually go in restaurants again. Shocking. I would still advise people, though, be careful. <laughs> be a little cautious. This virus is still what it always was, and there's still not a vaccine, so proceed with caution. But how thankful we are that things can open back up, businesses can stay alive, the economy can recover a little bit. That is good. This morning, I turned on Ravi Zacharias's memorial service. The whole thing is probably on YouTube. It was on YouTube Live, and that was amazing. A diversity of people from worship artists. Shane and Shane was on there. Tim Tebow was on there. I think that was Lecrae at the end that was on there. People with RZIM, family members. What an amazing, diverse impact that a guy that grew up in India dreaming to play cricket made. So I hope you enjoyed last week's tribute to Ravi. It's really hard to do justice, but feel like something ought to be done. This week, doing a little study through the book of Romans. What I've noticed in this study, even in the first half of Romans, is the number of times Romans addresses something that is a current apologetics issue. So apologetics is the theological branch and practice of giving a reasoned defense for the Christian faith so right away, in the first six verses of Romans, Paul lays out the proof of the status of Jesus as Messiah. He is promised. There's a line of prophecy leading to him. He is of the lineage of David. There are spiritual signs and authority that Jesus proved his status by. And there's a resurrection. So he's saying, isn't this what the Jews were hoping for? Who else could this be? This is your fulfilled Messiah. Is there objective evidence for God's existence? Romans 1, 18 through 20 is maybe the most popular apologetics-related verse in the book of Romans. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness, because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world's invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made. So there's the issue of suppressing the truth, of evidence available for people that it's clearly seen, and that it's understood through what has been made from creation. We now have what's called the cosmological argument and the teleological argument that go off of the things that have been made and show either that it is highly, highly likely that an intelligent creator did this, or proves with certainty that some necessary being must have been the cause of all temporal existence. In chapter 2, there's another argument for God's existence, the moral law reflects the existence of God there. Those who don't profess to live according to any particular faith still have a deep awareness of wrong, right, and standards for an objective moral law. So if there are objective rights and wrongs, which I believe is based on human value, then there must be some value giver, some law maker, so that these laws are not left merely to the preference of humans. What about those who have never heard? Have you heard that question? There's that little tribe way out on that island and they've never heard the gospel. Are they condemned to hell just because nobody got to them to preach the gospel? Well, Romans 1.20, since the existence of God is reflected in creation, Paul says they are without excuse. Nobody has an excuse to say, I didn't think there was a God. Uh, I never had enough information. And Paul would later go on to talk about Abraham, who had exactly zero scripture to look at and yet believed God and that was credited for righteousness. He had faith without anybody sharing this direct gospel with him. Related to Romans 2.28, so the black Hebrew Israelites, a group that's tried to spread their message on the UNM campus, they attempt to use the Bible to say that they are the special chosen nation and have the heritage that parallels that of the promised nation of the Old Testament. So the Jews, the Israelites, the Hebrews. Paul overthrows this sort of genetic hereditary argument and he says, no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly. The true Jew is one inwardly. So does God prefer a certain race above others? Have you heard that accusation before? God sure seems like a racist, prefers that race and hates that race. No, in fact, Romans 2 says also that God shows no partiality as it relates to people groups. 
Here it's in the context of Jews versus Gentiles. Is there a preferred race and a non-preferred race? God shows no partiality. They are saved the same way. Not that there's no benefit to the Jewish heritage. And 9.6 also says, Not all who descend from Israel belong to Israel. It's more than a genetic thing. It's a faith-based thing. That's a large point of this first half of the book of Romans. It's a faith-based thing. Whether you're of this heritage or that heritage, there's no partiality. He judges them all according to their faith. Here's a tough issue that's made its way into Christian apologetics. Is homosexuality wrong? To what extent is it wrong? What's it come from? Is it, is it just a, something you're born with? Romans 1, 26 to 27 says that people's denial of God leads them to reject natural and God-formed passions. Consequently, they go after people of the same gender. It's a result of the denial of God and his power. But lest we focus all our energy on homosexuality, that's not the only one listed. And this homosexuality is a symptom of not knowing God. It's just one of the symptoms, but it's a very real symptom. And many of these symptoms, Christians also have to learn to wrestle with. There's also pride in there and many others. So yes, homosexuality is wrong according to Romans chapter 1. Many other things are wrong. There need not be an extreme stigma about this. But we just need to realize it is a result of this widespread denial of God. At least four parts from the first half of Romans speak to the great apologetics issue of our time, the problem of evil. Why do bad things happen to good people? Well, Romans 3, 9 and 10 through 12a, it says that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside, and it goes on. No one really experiences bad who's not actually a bad person. So why do bad things happen to good people? You'd have to ask Jesus that as the only good person. How do you know that suffering is ever unjust? Do you have an idea of who a perfect, worthy person to not endure any suffering looks like? That may be the one that suffered the most. So we don't have room to say that bad things happen to good people. However, suffering is very real, and that's not to say that we should be without compassion over it. But suffering is also comparatively overwhelmed. Romans 8.18 says the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. A few verses later, you have the greater good theodicy. 8.28 says, We know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. But notice each part. This doesn't say that everything is good. Every evil that happens to you is good. The murder that happened down the street is good. It's not what it's saying. It says he causes it to work for good. Not for everybody, not for people who disobey him, who stray from him, but for those who love him and are walking in step with his purpose. He turns even those evil things into potential goods. Romans 8.17 has a theodicy of comfort. We don't suffer alone. We suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. You grow closer to the ones you suffer with. And ultimately, this suffering was taken on by God himself. God came close entered into that evil, and was thereby able to demonstrate his great love for us through that evil. Not to avoid it, but that he may enter into it and show the greatest demonstration of love and redeem us through it. Romans 5.8, God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Usually an apologetics or pastoral sort of issue within the Christian community is, will I lose my salvation if I stumble and make great mistakes? Well, Romans 8:38 to 39 says, For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So no, you stumbling, making a mistake, in a state in which you are living by faith in Christ for your salvation, no mistake is going to ultimately separate you from the love of God. He holds you secure. You can go to John 10 and read more about that. Here's an accusation from non-Christians who don't understand maybe the transforming nature of the presence of Christ in a Christian's life. They say, so if you can just keep your salvation in spite of the mistakes you make, can Christians just repent and confess Jesus and then do whatever they want and not compromise their salvation? So it's a license to sin? Well, technically, yes, we can maintain salvation in that state, but this is not how it happens. 
How can we who died to sin live in it? Says Romans 6, 2. You also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. 6, 11. That's what would demonstrate true faith, right? This actual deadness to sin and alive in Christ Jesus. If you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey. If you come to Christ, why would you be a slave to sin anymore? Romans 6.22 says you've been set free from sin. It's not fun to go out and sin for Christians. It's not something that they're seeking to go do. If they've really died to that nature, which is true Christianity, which is true faith, then there's this freedom, there's this satisfaction that is attained in life that people used to chase in their sin. Well, related to this, jump past Romans chapter 6 to chapter 7, why do Christians struggle and sometimes look like the life that they thought they had left behind? How can Christianity have any legitimacy if people who say they are Christians do bad things? That's another issue defenders of the Christian faith have to deal with. Christians do bad things, or priests do bad things, or this pastor committed adultery, or this Christian didn't treat me appropriately. Hypocrisy, right? must delegitimize the actual presence of God in their life, or the transforming power of the Christian faith. Well, I think Romans answers this in two ways. One, there is an ongoing struggle between the flesh and the spirit. This is very real. This was real for Paul, the author of Romans. 7, 21 to 23 says, I find then the principle that evil is present in me, the one who wants to do good. For I joyfully concur with the law of God in the inner man, but I see a different law in the members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin, which is in my members. Ah! He's a little irritated about this because he understands the battle between the flesh and the spirit going on inside him. But the second resolution that Romans seems to suggest is that it's not about having a label. Oh, that person's a pastor, Pharisee, worship leader, whatever. It's not about a label. It's about a change of heart. Many people have a Christian label, but their hearts continue to drift away from God. This is unfortunate because people are often easily fooled by labels. God's not. But people are fooled by labels. So if somebody is called a priest, that must mean they have a rich, vibrant walk with God. I don't know. I think many of the official teachings of the Catholic Church that can lead someone to become a priest, I think those people can remain in their sin, trusting in their own religiousness and not trusting in Christ. It can happen to anybody that they merely have the label, but they're not genuine. Some people, even from Christian spin-off groups, do not like the principle that we are guilty by something that Adam did. How are we held accountable for something that Adam did thousands of years ago? Well, Romans 3, 12 and 15 says, Death spread to all men because all sinned. Death spread because all sinned. There was both the genetic nature of being a sinner in fallen Adam, but there was also the actual practice of sin that occurs to all those people. It's kind of a double guilt. But Romans goes on, If many died through one man's trespass, much more has the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for many. In other words, we're held accountable under Adam's headship because this principle of headship would also be the means by which a reward that is greater than the fall of Adam could be distributed to all those coming to him in faith. If you don't like the negative, maybe you won't embrace the positive. What is the extent of God's sovereignty? Well, there's a tough question. Usually an issue that's dealt with within the Christian community. But also, sometimes you have opposition to Christianity saying sovereignty doesn't make sense. There seems to be a contradiction between God's sovereignty and man's free will. If God foreknows or if God is all-powerful, how is it that we can act freely? Well, there's not a big diatribe in this regard in the book of Romans because Romans is so focused on the justification of Jewish believers and Gentile believers through faith. But Romans 9 speaks some things about this. There's not injustice with God. We know that much from Romans 9.14. Ultimately, things are God's call. Romans 9.21 says, Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? But ultimately, in the justice of God, God has called both Jews and non-Jews his people. And remember, his sovereignty draws those who would not otherwise seek him. His sovereignty is not unjust. No. It has opened the route of righteousness to those who haven't done anything for God nor seek him. 
So rather than sovereignty being this means by which God is unfairly judging a certain people, no, this sovereignty is at work in such a way that those who do not seek God, who do not deserve anything from God, can yet enter into that covenant relationship with God and reap immeasurable benefits from it. Romans presents a much more positive view of God's sovereignty than one that would imply his injustice. Let's remember that the justice of God is working through grace in his sovereignty. It is not unjustly condemning anybody. It is drawing those who are deserving of punishment. Okay, a lot more could be said about sovereignty and how that works with free will. But by and large, it's sort of like the Job thing. Let's remember the great distance between man and God and not pretend to have God figured out in his will, in his ways. He's the potter, you're the clay. Okay, could make some more philosophical discussion out of that, but I want to get to what I think is probably the core apologetics thing that is displayed in the book of Romans. And this was Paul's objective, and surprisingly, or not surprisingly, it is still the objective today. How is one saved? You have many groups that want to be in line with some of the things that the Bible teaches. The LDS Church, the Jehovah's Witnesses, Black Hebrew Israelites, as I mentioned, Christian science even. Even much of Islam wants to be in line with a lot of what the Bible says. But if you miss how is one saved, you miss it entirely. If you replace the spirit with the flesh and try to be justified by the flesh and are not guided by the spirit, you've missed everything in the book of Romans and you've missed out on everything that God is offering. And this typically boils down to faith versus the law, grace versus works. The LDS church tends to teach the requirements of the law. Yeah, maybe there's grace in there, but really, you want to keep it, you got to follow the law. Even the Roman Catholic Church goes there a lot of times. Saved by grace, but maintain it by your works. In fact, salvation by grace alone was condemned at one of the councils. Jehovah's Witnesses tend to say they are perfected by following the law as well. In fact, every other world religion and false spin-off from Christianity adds works in order to meet their requirements for salvation. And no wonder... You're able to control people to a much greater extent through rules and regulations, right? Especially if these make the standard for salvation. How do you control people in your group? Tell them that there's an eternal reward if you do the things that they say. What faith, then, would come up with a grace-through-faith mechanism for salvation? It couldn't be one that seeks to be overly controlling about the people. And by the way, when you read the book of Romans, other New Testament books, there's not a whole lot of dictatorship or control that's going on in there. There's a few guidelines for how a church should vaguely look, but so much of it just presents the person of Christ to draw the person's heart to him. And yet, that faith has had more to say about the well-being of the world, the spread of positive values of charitable organizations, than any religion one that has the least direct control over the people, has gone on to make the biggest difference in the world. So if it is by faith and in the heart, rather than people being in control, it is God who's put in control. This is probably the most relevant thing in Christian apologetics to which Romans speaks. And it starts in verse 17 of chapter 1. The righteous shall live by faith. Romans 3.24, people are justified by his grace as a gift. He justifies the Gentiles, the traditionally non-religious by faith, and the Jews, the traditionally religious by faith also. Romans 4, 5, But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. And it describes Abraham and David, how they found God's grace and righteousness through faith. 4, 16, It depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace. You can't do it. You're dependent on grace. Romans 5, 1, since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. 5, 19, by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. 6, 23, the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Romans 8, 4, Christ came in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us. So what we couldn't do in that we are powerless in the flesh, Christ did on our behalf. This is not attained by doing better, by living according to the law, by being born under some heritage. It is through faith, a close adherence and trust in God, in Christ, that he lived the law on our behalf, fulfilled it for us, so that the righteous requirements are upheld in him, and our trust in him unites us with him, and our righteousness is credited from his righteousness. That is the means of salvation. World religions and false Christian spinoff groups need to know this, 
and a lot of discussions that take place between Christians and non-Christians, religious non-Christians, deal with this issue of faith versus works. Romans spells that out explicitly. It can't be by works. There's none righteous. No one really seeks after God. You're dependent on his grace. And that can only be attained through faith, so that it is actually grace. So, the first part of the book of Romans, while it's not necessarily a treatise in apologetics, it has a lot of overlap with today's issues facing apologetics. Good theology will always have a way of relating to potential issues in presenting and defending your faith. Romans communicates things that provide quality responses to a diversity of backgrounds. It answers the very atheistic to the very religious, holding both their feet to the fire. It is unreasonable for the atheist to remain atheist, and for those that are religious, it's unreasonable for them to trust in their religiousness to be right with God. Romans lays out the existence of God from the creation on the outside to the moral law on the inside. Romans shows that the requirements of God based on his impartiality include those who have never heard and those who have heard so much that they're almost numb to it. Romans briefly lays out Jesus' status as the Messiah. It gives a balanced, a firm but gracious explanation of the provoking causes of homosexuality and related sins. Romans lays out the reality of the continuing struggle for Christians, but it also lays out their ultimate security of salvation. Romans gives compelling resolutions to the problem of evil from sin and free will and the closeness of God. And it lays out the greater good that comes in spite of evil. And it reveals the upcoming overwhelming reward that outweighs the evil. It describes our association with Christ in the midst of evil. And it explains evil as the means through which the love of Christ could be maximally on display. The love of God is presented in the Christian faith, in the person Christ Jesus, in a way that the love of God is not on display in any competing worldview. Romans lays out the extent of God's sovereignty, which remains a bit mysterious, yet it gives us this glimpse of its glorious nature. And finally, and probably most thoroughly, Romans describes the place of faith versus works in God's plan of redemption and salvation. So I hope this was a fruitful and interesting discussion about the apologetics overlap in the first part of the book of Romans. Look forward to talking to you next time. And until then, go tell somebody, and may God bless and guide you.